Anticoagulation Principles, Warfarin, Part 1. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to the Farm Easy Tutor. My name is Ken Atto. Anticoagulation, it's such a broad topic, but it's a very important one for healthcare professionals to learn and to know about. Pharmacists regulate anticoagulants such as warfarin and heparin per protocols based on published guidelines, and they monitor and adjust doses for low molecular weight heparin and the direct acting oral anticoagulants known as the DOAX. Warfarin, also known as Coumadin, has been the mainstay oral anticoagulant for over the past 60 years. It is truly a complex medication with many significant drug-drug and drug-food interactions, narrow therapeutic goals, and complicated dosing regimens. In the poster behind me, you can see warfarin's chemical structure inside a blood vessel doing its work. Some say warfarin has now been supplanted by the introduction of the newer agents such as the DOAX, which are much easier to administer. However, there still remain a handful of indications where warfarin needs to be used, and so it is important to still know all about the drug. So that is where we will start our journey talking about anticoagulation with warfarin. We'll then move on and talk about heparin and low molecular weight heparin, and then finally, the direct acting oral anticoagulants known as the DOAX. I hope you'll enjoy this next set of lectures on anticoagulants. Warfarin, trade name Coumadin, has been a mainstay as an oral anticoagulant for over 60 years. However, with the introduction of the direct acting oral anticoagulants known as DOAX, the use of warfarin has significantly declined. Examples of the DOAX include dabigatrin or Pradaxa, Rivaroxaban or Xarelto, and Apixaban, Eliquis. Furthermore, in 2016, cardiology guidelines recommended using DOAX over warfarin in patients with DV of the leg or PE and no cancer, which was previously one of warfarin's top uses. So is this the demise of warfarin? Is warfarin now a dead drug? Well, the reports of warfarin's death are greatly exaggerated as the drug continues to be used in many patients to this day. We will talk about those specific patients later on in this lecture. Because warfarin continues to be used, pharmacists and healthcare professionals need to be well versed on this complex medication. This lecture series on warfarin will be presented in four parts. Part one will talk about the history and use of warfarin. Part two, its mechanism and drug interactions. Part three, how to dose warfarin. And part four, the management of bleeding and patient counseling. The discovery of warfarin originates in the dairy industry. At the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, the dairy industry became huge in Wisconsin. Hay and corn were used as the standard cattle feed. They needed more feed. They knew that sweet clover flourished on poor soil and could be substituted for corn as feed for livestock. So they used the marginal land in the Dakota Plains to grow sweet clover to use as feed. The cattle started developing a bleeding disorder. In 1924, a Canadian veterinarian, Frank Schofield, reported a bleeding disorder developing in the cattle. The cattle hemorrhaged to death after minor injuries or had severe internal bleeding. The year of the serious cattle losses had been an unusually warm one. Sweet clover has more moisture than hay, so it rotted very easily. Schofield suspected that the bleeding was caused by the ingestion of spoiled sweet clover feed that functioned as a potent anticoagulant. This led to the discovery of an anticoagulant named dicumarol. In 1939, the feed was analyzed by Carl Paul Link and his student Harold Campbell, chemists working at the University of Wisconsin. 
Link theorized that the plant chemical coumarin that was contained in the clover was subjected to heat and mold in a silo, forming a double molecule that functioned as a powerful anticoagulant. They identified this chemical as dicoumarol, bis-4-hydroxycoumarin. Below are some chemical structures of similar derivatives, including warfarin. You can see the chemical compound of coumarin and the double molecule, which was formed called dicoumarol, which was the potent anticoagulant, and how its similar structure is to the chemical structure of warfarin. Dicoumarol was initially used as a rat poison. Dicumarol did cause rats to bleed, but the chemical was not potent enough. Dr. Ling continued to work on developing more potent coumarin-based anticoagulants used for rodent poisons. Warfarin, a new rat poison. In 1948, Ling developed the more potent synthetic derivative of dicumarol. He named it warfarin, an acronym taken from Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation plus the IN from coumarin, the original compound from sweet clover. Warfarin was introduced as an extremely effective rodenticide against rats and mice. A potential for the use of warfarin as a therapeutic agent for thromboembolic disease was recognized. The use was not widely accepted due to its connection as a rat poison and the fear of unacceptable toxicity. Heparin generated more research interest. However, in 1951, an army inductee took a massive dose of rat poison, warfarin, in an attempted suicide, and he survived. After this incident, studies began using warfarin as a therapeutic anticoagulant. In 1954, Warfarin was approved for medical use in humans. The following year, President Dwight Eisenhower was prescribed warfarin after suffering a heart attack. Since then, warfarin has been a mainstay in the prevention of thromboembolic disease. By 1999, warfarin was the 11th most frequently prescribed drug in the United States. The product trademarked Coumadin is a form of crystalline sodium warfarin that removes all traces of impurities and is safe for human consumption. So why do we need to monitor warfarin? Why does it require pharmacists time to look closely at this drug? Well, that's because anticoagulants are classified as high-risk drugs. Anticoagulants are considered high-risk drugs for causing adverse drug events. Anticoagulants include warfarin, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparins, and the DOAX. Anticoagulants are included on the ISMP Institute for Safe Medication Practices high alert medication list due to the significant risk of causing life-threatening bleeding. Anticoagulants are one of the top five drug types associated with patient safety incidents. Warfarin and insulin cause an estimated one in every seven adverse drug events treated in emergency departments, and more than a quarter of all hospitalizations. Among older adults, greater than or equal to 65 years of age, oral anticoagulants are the most common cause of adverse drug events, leading to emergency room visits and emergent hospitalizations. Each year between 2013 and 2014, Warfarin was responsible for 32% of estimated emergency room visits for all adverse drug events among older adults and 36% of estimated emergent hospitalizations for all adverse drug events among older adults. Warfarin is challenging to use in clinical practice for many reasons. It exhibits considerable interpatient variability in dose response to therapy. It is subject to significant interactions with drugs and diet. It requires drawing of the appropriate laboratory parameters to monitor clinical response and for proper dosage adjustment. It has a laboratory control that can be difficult to standardize. Other reasons include it has a narrow therapeutic window. 
If levels are too high, you get bleeding. If levels are too low, you may get a clot. There is a high potential for complications. It has problems in dosing as a result of patient noncompliance, lack of patient education, and miscommunication between the patient and physician. And it is used in a variety of settings and by various practitioners. Now let's talk a little bit about National Patient Safety Goal 03.05.01. The Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, TJC, is an organization that accredits more than 22,000 U.S. healthcare systems and programs. In 2002, the Joint Commission implemented initiatives for accredited hospitals and organizations for improving patient safety called National Patient Safety Goals, NPSG. In 2005, the Joint Commission implemented a new National Patient Safety Goal labeled as Goal Number 3C, designed to improve the safety of medication use. In 2008, the Commission adopted Goal Number 3E, which was aimed to improve safety for those patients receiving anticoagulants. In 2009, Goal 3E was now being identified as National Patient Safety Goal 03.05.01. And finally, in 2019, that patient safety goal was updated to include eight new elements of performance. On the next three slides, I'll go over the requirements for National Patient Safety Goal 03.05.01. The hospital organization uses approved protocols and evidence-based practice guidelines for the initiation and maintenance of anticoagulant therapy, including direct-acting oral anticoagulants, the DOACs, that address medication selection, dosing including adjustments for age and renal or liver function, drug-drug and drug-food interactions, and other risk factors. Approved protocols should include steps for the reversal of anticoagulation and management of bleeding events related to each anticoagulant medication, evidence-based practice guidelines for perioperative management of all patients on oral anticoagulants, and a written policy addressing the need for baseline and ongoing laboratory tests to monitor and adjust anticoagulant therapy. The hospital or organization addresses anticoagulation safety practices by identifying, reporting, and evaluating anticoagulant adverse drug events and develops steps for improvement, provides education to patients and families specific to the anticoagulation medication prescribed, uses only oral unit dose products, pre-filled syringes, or pre-mixed infusion bags, and uses programmable infusion pumps to provide consistent and accurate dosing. What evidence-based data will I be using for my lecture? It is called the ACCP Guidelines. ACCP stands for American College of Chest Physicians. The title of the guidelines is Antithrombotic and Thrombolytic Therapy, ACCP Evidence-Based Clinical Practice Guidelines, 9th edition. It was published in CHEST in February of 2012. This is considered the gold standard for anticoagulation. The full 8th edition of the ACCP guidelines were published in 2008, and the 9th edition, which is the most current, was published online in 2012. The ACCP guidelines were updated in 2016 and 2021, but the complete guidelines were not published. Here are the indications for warfarin. Warfarin is effective for prevention and treatment of venous thrombosis and its extension pulmonary embolism, prevention and treatment of thromboembolic complications associated with atrial fibrillation and or cardiac valve replacement, and reduction in the risk of death, recurrent myocardial infarction, and thromboembolic events such as stroke or systemic embolization after myocardial infarction. In 2012, the ACCP guidelines stated a change in warfarin's preferred use. 
They stated, in patients with DVT of the leg or PE and no cancer, as long-term first three months anticoagulant therapy, we suggest dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or adoxaban over vitamin K antagonist warfarin therapy. This pretty much canceled out the first indication for warfarin, where DOAX are primarily used now. Also, for prevention and treatment of thromboembolic complications such as stroke associated with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, the general preference for prescribers is to use a DOAC rather than warfarin. However, there are a few patient groups in which warfarin is preferred over DOACs. In renal failure or renal insufficiency, for patients with chronic severe kidney disease, whose creatinine clearance by cockroft galt equation is less than 25 to 30 ml per minute, warfarin is generally preferred. Warfarin's clearance does not rely on the renal route of elimination. Package inserts for DOAC states, avoid use if creatinine clearance is less than 15 for rivaroxaban and adoxaban. Avoid use if creatinine clearance is less than 15 to 30 for dabigatran and for apixaban it is not specified. However, some clinicians prescribe apixaban for selected patients in this setting. Clinical safety and efficacy studies with DOACs did not enroll patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis. Here are some other situations where warfarin use is preferred over DOACs. Patients with antiphospholipid syndrome or APS Warfarin is recommended as first-line therapy. We'll talk more about APS in an upcoming segment in this lecture series. For patients who are not likely to comply with the twice daily dosing of dabigatran or apixaban, and who are unable to take once a day rivaroxaban or doxaban due to intolerance. And for patients for whom the DOAC agents will lead to an unacceptable increase in patient out-of-pocket costs. Here's an illustration of what a DVT or deep vein thrombosis looks like in the leg. The thrombosis builds up below the valves that usually hold up blood in the leg veins. These thrombi can then loosen themselves and travel to the lungs, causing what is known as PE or pulmonary embolism. The combination of DVT and PE is called VTE or venous thromboembolism. Here's a diagram showing where VTE occurs and their key symptoms. Here's another picture showing how a thrombus can be carried from the leg and travel to the lungs to cause a PE. To summarize part one, we described the history of warfarin, how it was discovered and how it was developed as an anticoagulant. We explained why warfarin is a high alert medication. We listed eight reasons why warfarin is a drug that requires close monitoring. And we reviewed how JCO's anticoagulation NPSG requirements impact the pharmacy department. In part two of this four part series on warfarin anticoagulation, we'll summarize the mechanism of action of warfarin explain how genetic factors, disease states, and diets can significantly affect warfarin therapy, and review the many, many drug-drug interactions that increase warfarin's effect and those that reduce its effect. So stay tuned. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.